Hey all, Glenn Kirshner here, former federal prosecutor, former Army JAG. I want to try to tackle the issue of pardons today. A lot of you have asked questions in recent weeks and months about um, the presidential pardon power. For example, um, does the president retain his pardon power even after he's been impeached? And can the president pardon himself? And can the president pardon his co-conspirators, the people who have been criming right along with him while he's been president? And I want to take those questions in order, uh, but let's start with the Constitution. So the Constitution gives the president the power to, quote, grant reprieves and pardons for offenses against the United States, except in cases of impeachment, close quote. Now, we all want to grab hold of that phrase, except in cases of impeachment, um, and try to argue that that must mean after he's been impeached, the president can't grant pardons anymore. And that's not the way legal scholars interpret that clause, and I think they're right. What that actually means is that a president cannot pardon somebody who's been impeached. So in other words, he can't wipe that impeachment off of somebody's record by issuing a pardon. He can pardon people for crimes because it says offenses committed against the United States, but he can't use his pardon power to wipe an impeachment off somebody's record. Unfortunately, like it or not, President Trump, even though he himself has been impeached, retains the power to pardon others. So what about a self-pardon? Now, first of all, there is no law. There's no appellate court case. There's no Supreme Court precedent. Nothing in the Constitution answers the question about whether a president can pardon himself. The Constitution is silent on that. So here are some of the arguments for and against. Some of the people who take the position that a president, a criminal president can pardon himself, um, argue that because the Constitution grants the president the power to issue pardons, and it doesn't restrict that power or prohibit it in any way when it comes to a self-pardon, that must mean the president can do it, right? Nothing prohibiting him from doing it. I don't buy that argument. I'm not persuaded by that argument because the Constitution also doesn't prohibit the president from for example, uh, kidnapping and imprisoning his political opponents without cause. Um, but I don't think anyone would argue, I hope no one would argue, including Bill Barr, that a president can lawfully, without cause, without evidence, kidnap and imprison his political opponents. Um, the flip side of the argument that a president ought not be able to pardon himself I think is supported by really the underpinnings of our criminal justice system, among other things, because you know there is this well-worn maxim that no person can be a judge in their own trial, right? You cannot sit as a judge in a case that you have an interest in the outcome, either a, a liberty interest or a financial interest or a familial interest or an employment interest. You can't be a judge in a case like that because you have a vested interest in the outcome. Frankly, you can't be a prosecutor in a case like that or a defense attorney in a case like that either. Um, so I think the whole basis for our system of conflicts of interest in our criminal justice system suggests that because no one can be a judge in their own trial, a president shouldn't be allowed lawfully to pardon himself for crimes he's committed. The other um, way to look at this is, I think there's another part of the Constitution that gives us some support, even if only by way of analogy, for the argument that a president cannot pardon himself. And it's the impeachment clause. Think about this. When somebody is impeached and then tried in the Senate, and when I say somebody, I'm talking about cabinet officials or judges, who is it that presides over the Senate trial? It's the vice president. Right? However, there's one exception to that, and it's when the president is impeached by the House and then tried in the Senate. The vice president does not preside. We all know this now because we sat through that painful, I don't want to call it a trial, but a political show, sham, um, because there were no witnesses, no evidence, no documents. It was basically politicians speaking. 
Um, but the vice president is prohibited from presiding over a Senate trial when the president is on trial. Why? Because the vice president has an interest in the outcome of that proceeding. Because if the president is convicted and removed by the Senate, the vice president becomes president. So of course the vice president doesn't preside over a Senate trial of the president. And here's where I think we find the analogous support. If the vice president were impeached and tried by the Senate, who would preside over that trial? Well, the Constitution is silent. The Constitution doesn't prohibit the vice president from presiding over a trial of the vice president. But wouldn't we all conclude that it would be ridiculous? It would be nonsense. There's no way the vice president could preside over his own trial in the Senate. I think by way of analogy, the same arguments hold true that even if the Constitution is silent on some things, there's no way a president or a court, and I'll get to that in a minute, should or would ever endorse the notion that a president can go out and commit a whole bunch of crimes and then just pardon himself. Um, what about co-conspirators? I would argue the same rationale holds true that if you have, if you're not permitted to pardon yourself because you can't sit as a judge in your own case, that should extend to your co-conspirators, the folks you've been criming with all along. You can't possibly lawfully and legitimately exercise your pardon power to pardon your partners in crime. And I don't think courts would endorse or endure that either. Now, there's really only one way to test this, and I predict it will be tested come January when President Biden um, begins to have to tackle these, these thorny issues. Let's assume, we don't know what's gonna happen between November and January, but let's assume that if President Trump loses in a landslide, um, he may very well try to do a number of things. He may pardon himself because all that takes is directing somebody to draft up a one-page pardon and having Donald Trump sign it. I, the President Donald J. Trump, hereby pardon Donald J. Trump. He may also try to um, resign, maybe a week shy of the end of his term so that President Pence can pardon him as well. We don't know any of this, but these are possible scenarios. He probably will also grant wholesale pardons of his family members, you know, the Don Juniors and the Kushners and maybe the Ivankas and others. He may grant wholesale pardons of Pompeo and Mulvaney and, um, and Barr and goodness knows how many of the people in the Congress who have been enabling him and assisting him and sort of succeeding in all of the crimes he's been committing. Um, and of course, we know from the um, fact that President Ford pardoned former President Nixon for the crimes he committed, even though Nixon had never been charged with a crime. President Ford issued what's called a, a prospective pardon. It's really a kind of immunity saying, and he said, um, President Ford said that he was pardoning Richard Nixon for every federal offense he had or may have committed. So you can pardon somebody um, even if they haven't been charged with any crime. So do you think Donald Trump is going to issue wholesale pardons on his way out the door for his family members and his criminal co-conspirators? I would certainly bet a buck that he will. But here's what then I think should happen. That once the Don Juniors and the Kushners and the, you know, Bars and the Pompeos and the Mulvaney's and the rest of them are investigated, if there is enough evidence supporting criminal charges, they should be indicted, they should be charged, they should be hauled into court. And then we would have to litigate the legality of those prospective presidential pardons of co-conspirators, assuming the evidence showed that they were in fact co-conspirators of Donald Trump. So just because the president issues pardons 
that is not necessarily the end game. Charges can still be brought against the person pardoned if the prosecutors have a good faith basis to argue that it was an illegal pardon. It was against public policy. It was against the spirit of the Constitution. It was against anything our government is willing to endorse. And I suggest that that is what should happen um, to test those pardons. People will say there's no precedent for it. Well, you know what? The only way to create precedent is to do it a first time. And you may not win, but that's okay. If you've got the law and the facts and justice on your side, there's no shame in losing. But you can't create precedent until you do it the first time. And there would nothing that, there's nothing that would be worthier of doing a first time than trying to hold accountable Donald Trump and his co-conspirators for the crimes they committed even if Trump had issued across the board pardons for them all. Thanks folks. Um, as always, please stay safe. Please stay coronavirus free. And tomorrow I'm gonna try to tackle the implication of a pardon as it might apply to the Mike Flynn case, depending on what Judge Emmett Sullivan does with Bill Barr's uh, motion to dismiss the Mike Flynn guilty plea. I'll see you again soon, folks.